welcome to the September 25th, 2018 school board meeting of the Shorewood School District. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Our first order of business is to adopt the agenda. I move that we adopt the agenda. I second, and I can't turn on my microphone. Okay. Um, I actually am going to ask that we uh, table um, item 5A, approval of the 2018-2019 teacher salary schedule. Uh, the SEA Executive Committee would like to be here for that discussion, and they were unable to come today. So I'd like to table that till our next meeting. So I will take, if there's no further discussion, I'll take a new motion. Okay, I, I move that we adopt the agenda, uh, removing item five and tabling it to the next meeting. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries, 5-0. Um, Dr. Davis, can you remind us of our overarching result? Uh, yes, our overarching result for the School District of Shorewood is that our students are leaders who challenge themselves to grow and achieve academically, pursue their passions, navigate change, learn continuously, and contribute to the common good. Thank you. Uh, awards and recognitions tonight. Uh, yes, uh, first of all, uh, congratulations goes out to three SHS seniors who are announced as the semifinalists for the 64th Annual National Merit Scholarship Program, uh, Jonathan Hegelmeyer, uh, uh, Daryu Meng, and Tessa Paterka. Um, so these three will have the opportunity to continue in the competition for some uh, 7,500 National Merit Scholarships worth more than $32 million that will be offered next spring. Uh, so we wish them the best of luck and congratulations on even making the semifinalists. Uh, so congratulations to them. Uh, also like to uh, take a second to recognize all the students and staff members who participated in the planning, organizing, and the supervising of uh, homecoming uh, weekend festivities. Uh, the pep rally, parade, uh, football game, and dance uh, went uh, according to plan. So uh, great job, everyone. And uh, it was a, a, a fun and safe event, uh, which is what our homecoming week is meant to be. So. Congratulations to everyone that was involved in that. Uh, also, uh, athletically, congratulations to the boys' varsity cross-country team, who at the Smiley Invitation in, in, uh, Invitational in, in Wausau two weekends ago uh, won the Division II competition uh, against three ranked teams. So the JV also ran well, taking a second place in the combined Division II and Division III races. Additionally, um, in the varsity race, three athletes placed in the top ten. So uh, keep up the good work, boys. Uh, next recognition goes to the varsity boys soccer team who has been ranked number one in Division Three for the past two weeks. Uh, great job to them and keep up the good work. Good luck the rest of the season. And lastly, want to acknowledge our varsity boys football team who won their homecoming game against South Milwaukee and also won last week at Greenfield. Uh, with both of those wins, the team has successfully clinched a playoff berth. So uh, congratulations wow. to the boys. Uh, well done. So, and that concludes the awards and recognitions for tonight. Great. Thank you. Um, so up first tonight, for student achievement and results, we um, are going to have a presentation by the SIS 8th grade ambassadors. You guys can actually, um, why don't you go right to the mics, that way we can, we can hear you. Uh, <laughs> and we might have to pull a couple chairs up. No, I can stand. Okay. We want to make, is the mic on? I mean, can you check the mic and make sure the mic's on? Okay. Hey, Mickey. You might have to pull the mic. Yeah, there you go. Your time. That good? Time. Yeah. You guys, yep. Go ahead and pull up chairs. So this is Paulina Fenske, Izzy Rosenberg, and Maya Lindeval. And tonight we are here to talk to you about what the Student Ambassador Program does. We are speaking on behalf of 50 plus students that also participated in this. And my peers here will talk to you about what it is and what we do. safety in our school, which, um, and those are some of the core values of SIS, which make it really nice for us to kind of share those with other students. 
whether they are also in creators or younger. Um, we try to be role models for the younger students as well as the ones that are the same age as us. Um, and we also kind of represent our grade when we, um, when we meet to discuss things. We want to make sure that um, seventh graders and other students at our school are comfortable and acclimated. So we want to create a positive and fun experience for them so that they are comfortable to come to school every day and excited. have some pictures from the first day of school. Okay, so these are some pictures from when we cheered on the seventh graders while they were entering SIS. <laughs> so those are two cool. more pictures. find their lockers and find their way to class and we make sure that everybody knows that we are there to lend a helping hand. So kind of like a branch of the ambassadors is like um, the student advisory board. Um, problems that are faced by all, if not all, most of the students at SIS. Um, so we had, we've had our first meeting. And well, at our first meeting, we um, all got a sheet of paper that had um, questions on it, and we, and they had situations such as, like, interactions with peers and other staff members, and we ranked them to see which ones would be the, which ones are our like biggest situation and problems and we thought of some, wait, no, we used those to realize that those were our biggest problems and, and then we're gonna try to solve those situations throughout the year. Thank you for letting us take your time tonight, but I hope you learned something about uh, this is a very new the student advisory board is very new, and the ambassador has been a thing that we have done for a couple of years. Yeah, so thank you. Great. Questions? Any questions? So, what are the issues that you're working on this year? Well, so <laughs> one of the biggest issues we thought was with um, clicks. If you know what clicks are, like really, you know, to explain it, but I mean, yeah, like they have like like labels and such, we want to kind of break, we want to try to break that barrier this year. So can I ask you a little bit yes. about kind of the, um, so this is the second year of the ambassadors program? So the student ambassador program has been around for several years where the students come, eighth graders come on the first day and help students find their lockers and help out with guided study. I think the difference is this year we call on them more often so if, in week two, some students were still struggling with lockers and things, and teachers were actually saying, I only have 35 minutes, I can't help 37th graders. So then we were able to call on them and say, hey, can you go and help out with lockers and that type of thing. So being able to use them more often, which has been great, because before it was kind of like, oh, what are we going to do? We don't have time to help the students. And then what's even better is that now that you know you have a core group of people, when we have new students and tours and things of that nature, we have a group of who we know we can go directly to. And then they get the leadership, and then that helps with the teachers kind of to get the kids situated. The student advisory board, though, is new. So that is something new that we're trying to implement this year. We're really trying to figure out how do we get student voice? Like, how do we hear what the students are saying? And how do we help coming from the students? And so our first meeting actually was over the so imagine trying to get kids in over the summer, they came in. And <laughs> they did, they came in and we looked at again some scenarios and just kind of what are things that we want to attack. 
also knowing we can't fix everything, but what can we at least try for our first time? And so um, now that school is back in, we'll meet again, but we'll have other students who missed the meeting. Mm -hmm. And then how do we attack at least one thing so that in June we can say we tried this and how successful were we? That's great. And, and are seventh and eighth graders part of the student advisory board or is eighth graders? Just eighth grade. Okay. Yeah, just eighth grade. And that way they can show that leadership. And mm -hmm. then, too, when I see them in the building, I'm like, hey, you're a student advisory board, you know, leadership, show role models, all those things that look good. Mm -hmm. Great. And how have the seventh graders responded to the ambassador program? They didn't have that when my kids were in at middle school, so I think that's pretty great. Yeah. So on the first day, kind of when we welcomed them, welcomed them, they were like happy yet a little bit scared. <laughs> and, um, throughout the day, we kind of showed them that like they shouldn't be that intimidated by us, and that always if they just need help, they can like call for help from a fellow student. I think it's great because, you know, SIS is such a quick time, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of by the time you figure out what you're doing and you figure out everything, then you're oh, out and you're to the high school. So I really appreciate that you guys are trying to help your fellow students and particularly the seventh graders because I do know um, a handful of seventh graders this year were a little apprehensive about coming to SIS. And particularly when you come from Atwater and Lake Bluff and you meet, you know, all new people and you come together. I really like that you guys are available for all the students, so thank you. Thanks for coming in in the summer, and thanks for doing this. It's really cool. So I too would like to congratulate you and thank you. Um, I wish this would have existed when I was at middle school, <laughs> um, because it's a, it's a tough time. It's a really tough time. But quick question for you, uh, Ms. Grace. How would one join, and how do you identify these students in some grade so that you can get them to do beautiful welcome like they did on the first day of school? So what <coughs> happened this summer was when I was thinking about kids for the student advisory board, it was really difficult to contact kids over the summer. And so it was interesting because I was emailing parents and not getting a response. And I'm thinking people are in Hawaii, <laughs> right? So <laughs> I realized that I need to then in June of the previous year start to have those conversations about who would be the best people because it would it'd be easier to contact them. But what I was trying to find, um, so the ambassadors, we pick a lot of people. So you don't have to have top grades, top behavior. Would you be a really good person to be able to help somebody else? Or do you have the potential to show leadership? You haven't shown it yet. And this might be your opportunity mm -hmm. to show it. So we pick a lot of different types of people. And even the student advisory board, which is much smaller, 10 to 12 people but also the same type of people. So what I did was I emailed the teachers and I said, who in seventh grade, and of course over the summer, but who in seventh grade showed some leadership or maybe potential for leadership, who could use this to springboard you know, to the next level or out of some things that maybe they don't want to do this year. So teachers recommended, and I kind of had my own mind about who I thought, and so that's kind of where I made my list. And I actually had um, a student say, I'm not interested. So a week goes by, we talk a little bit more, and I bring it up again, and then I bring it up again, and I said, are you interested now? And he said, I'm thinking about it. So it was one of those situations where kids are kind of like, well, what are you talking about? And need that springboard, but they also need that push just to kind of know that this is something that they'll be valuable on. And so that's really where my head is when selecting students. Okay, well, thank you. And uh, to the wonderful eighth graders that are here representing your group, um, do you see certain patterns of like needs from students um, where you can kind of fill in and, and and create a space for them to feel more welcome or feel more connected? <laughs> uh, are you talking about the seventh graders or the eighth graders? I guess both. For seventh graders, like I know a lot of seventh graders, so like in the hall I see them like hey, so-and-so, and I talk with them a little bit as they're on their play class, like if they're feeling nervous or something, they can just like relax because they're talking to a friend, and just, yeah. Yeah, the game plan, that's right. <laughs> and then would this help, like had you had, when you were in seventh grade, had seventh graders be ambassadors to kind of break down some of those clicks and those barriers that especially, I guess, are more pronounced during lunch, maybe? Is that still the case? Like where you said, yeah. I remember 
that space well. <laughs> <laughs> Not always the best memories. <laughs> so do you think like uh, when you were in seventh grade and you were seeing some of those, had you had like ambassadors that were your age? Because are, are there eighth graders? It's a seventh grade lunch and then an eighth grade lunch, right? So you're not there, seventh graders now during lunch. No. Now you're there for the eighth graders that are there. I'm just wondering, like, having students like the ones you brought, Ms. Grace, having them like for the eighth graders must be wonderful. But like the seventh graders during lunch, can, which can be a very intimidating and lonely time for some students that you, as you mentioned, that maybe aren't part of the clique. I'm not speaking from experience. I'm <laughs> asking for a friend. <laughs> well, no, but actually that is something that, so they've only met once, but that is something that we're going to talk about within these clicks. How do we, how do they, but me helping them get there, how do they figure out how to break down some of the clicks? We talked about that quite a bit. But we also talked about, in our first meeting, but we also talked about clicks in the classroom, like the learning. How do we break up the learning? How do we get to know one another? Um, and so we kind of talked just a little bit, but about, do we do like a musical chair lunch where people sit somewhere else and get to know each other? know, once a month or whatever. We're also doing a lot of that through our guided study work as well, like building connections mm -hmm. and things. But still, what can students say? And so we did an activity last January where we did the winter experience, and the kids loved it. They said it was great. But then they said all of our other activities weren't so fun. They didn't enjoy them. So OK, well, what do you enjoy? How do we get across our four core values and still have fun at the same time? And so that's what they want to be able to tell us. And we want to listen. That's great. I'm glad that there's a that you found a space for a student voice um, in this kind of this conversation and these decisions because I think they have great ideas. So Thanks, thank you guys. Thanks for all your thank work. Thank you for coming in. <laughs> okay. Um, up next, public comments. Number one. Okay. Um, so then, uh, next agenda item is district operations, and so Tim Joyne is going to share with us our school perception survey results. Hello. Hi. Um, so I'm here to present the um, school perceptions survey data, um, and I sent you guys a um, PowerPoint uh, PDF to kind of give a brief overview um, of that. Uh, last year, there's there's lots and lots of information, but I did kind of want to just highlight some key pieces of it um, as we go through. Um, and so, uh, kind of just a high level overview, um, we do survey um, three stakeholders every year. Uh, that's parents and community, staff and students. The parents and community is actually probably the most interesting one that we do with school perceptions because there is a ton of um, effort that school perceptions actually does for us. So they actually manually make sure that every parent gets two codes, as well as then aligns that with our community survey so that they're not getting separate codes. So each person gets one code. So when the postcards are going out, they're the same as the email that the parents are getting, which is pretty impressive. Every time I talk to um, Sue Peterson about that, she likes to mention that that's something that Charlotte started. So oh, nice. kudos to us. Um, but we do try to get that out. If we do miss anyone, we, we try to, um, have them have someone to go to that we can get uh, an, an actual survey code to them. So we do parents and community members every year, all staff, um, and that includes teachers, aides, support, and custodial staff. Um, so any and all staff we do um, ask to participate, as well as students, and that's again gonna be fourth through 12th grade for our student surveys. Um, just from a, a language um, piece, that's why we can't go below the, the fourth mm -hmm. grade. Um, so in terms of respondents, 714 total responses, parent community survey, slightly less than the first year, but well within the neighborhood of what we got the, our first year. Um, staff survey, pretty much the same at 209 total responses, and student survey at 998 total responses. Um, so overall, and I think this is really important, um, is that school perceptions provides what are called indices um, for each one of the survey. And you saw some of the indices uh, during our character and wellness conversation, character and citizenship and wellness conversation last time. It's groups of questions that they believe are high impact questions that build to a total index. Um, and so when we talked about connectedness, there was four or five questions that build to that connectedness index. 
So their index is for the parent community survey, their index is for the staff survey, and their index is for the student survey. So what we typically look at when we look at the results from school perception survey, what you start with is how are we doing with those indexes? Because if we're failing to meet one of those indexes, that's where we want to dive in especially and start taking a look at what's going on. Um, school perceptions notes that a plus or minus 0.2 average is when you start to see significantly different results. So as you compare to peer districts, if you are below two tenths of a point, you are signif statistically significantly below, and that's something you need to look into. If you are above 0.2 of your peer districts, you're statistically significantly above, and that's definitely a, a time for celebration because you're doing something um, that most other districts are not doing. So overall, what's really important to note is that Shorewood actually performed within that 0.2 statistical significance or above. We never actually, in an index, fell below that statistical significance point. Quite honestly, we never actually fell below six one hundredths below the index average of other peer districts um, on all three surveys. So overall, as we look at this survey, we're doing okay. It doesn't mean that we're not gonna look at the data and we're not gonna continue to, to hopefully achieve highly in these areas, um, but it is important to note that as you look at the overall survey, we're performing within statistical significance or above in all areas. So as we start to look at uh, the parent and community survey, um, one of the things I wanted to highlight is the how we are doing um, page, and that's where it looks at a lot of our district strategic action plans. So there's actually not a peer district comparison when we look at the how are we doing, because those are short specific. Um, and so each district would have their own strategic action, how are we doing, um, that wouldn't necessarily line up. So a lot of those you'll notice are um, terms that we use within our strategic plan or terms that we use in our uh, board result policies. Um, and so as you look through those, you can kind of see the difference between non-parents and parents and kind of the differences there. Ultimately, um, as we kind of look at them, we try to look at the highs and the lows, right? So where are we performing high, where are we performing um, where we could maybe do some work. Um, so as you look at the how are we doing, you look at communicating school district news and happenings, which is already connected to our OE9, communication with um, stakeholders, um, as well as building character and citizenship. So why do we believe these happen? We did have a new website that came out. We have a bit more increased social media presence, so we're believing that potentially communicating school district news and happenings has something to do with that as well as building character and citizenship, you just had a presentation on some focuses on character and citizenship, right? So you can see that it is definitely a focus throughout the district um, on character and citizenship. Where do we believe that we have uh, some room for growth would be fostering students' mental wellness, um, which falls again into result four, as well as maintaining and modernizing facilities, OE12. Um, and so the interesting part is while these are coming out within the survey, they're also things that we monitor at the board level. And I think that's important to note that a lot of these do come within those board reports as well. Um, we have some moves uh, that we're making with fostering students' mental wellness in uh, the SSIS curriculum at the elementary and SIS level, as well as a gain screener at SIS and SHS um, that we're piloting this year. Um, you'll hear more, uh, a little bit more about particularly the SSIS during the um, RTI work group update. Um, and maintaining and modernizing facilities, um, you guys get a, a lot of kudos here uh, for the work that you've, you've been asked to do with maintaining and modernizing facilities. So we have some work to do. We're in the process of doing that work. Um, Quick question yep. about this. Um, Non-parents here are uh, identified as people who don't, are not currently parents don't currently have students in the schools? Correct. Okay. I wonder if, if there's a way to disaggregate <coughs> that even more because I think it would be really interesting to know um, uh, how, let's say, somebody like Joanne, who has kids who've graduated, mm -hmm. if somebody like that feels like, yes, the district is doing great at preparing people academically or on any of these, versus somebody who's never had a kid right. in the district. Completely removed. Because mm -hmm. that non-parents group is kind of a yeah, and we might be able to get something interesting out of that because obviously parents are going to be really tuned in to have kids. Mm -hmm. Their own kids are doing it. 
I do believe we asked the question of non-parents, did they have children in the district mm -hmm. on the introductory page? So there's a possibility that we could actually disaggregate that data. I just don't know off the top of my head if that's a disaggregatable um, piece, but we certainly, I think it's something that we probably could do. Yep. Um, building upon that, we actually, um, an interesting correlation is to start look at the staff survey where we ask the exact same questions of how are we doing um, with those strategic action plans. And again, going back to the highs and the lows, the really interesting piece is there's a lot of correlation between what parents and community members are saying as well as staff members. Um, so what are the highs? Communicating school district news and happenings. Again, hopefully be due to some of the moves that we made there with the new website um, and increased uh, social media presence. The one that's different is actually mastering academics, which I would assimilate to our R2. Um, I think, you know, quite honestly, our, our staff has um, had some pretty heavy looks at curriculum, particularly in our core areas. Um, we've gone through uh, math review, we've gone through social studies review, we've gone through science review. Um, six through 12 ELA went last year and now we're working on K through six. Um, and so there, there's been a, a heavy lift in terms of trying to align curriculum um, that potentially our staff is saying, you know, we're really working on this mastering academics piece. Um, again, the analysis, interestingly enough, exactly the same as what the parents and community are saying, fostering students' mental wellness and maintaining and modernizing facilities, um, R4 and OE12 uh, that we're looking at there. And again, we, we're, we're working on those areas with a few different strategic plans, uh, actions. Diving into the student survey and kind of giving you a little bit of a look at what those indexes look like. Um, what I wanted to bring to light were actually the um, indices that we talked about uh, at our last meeting. Mm -hmm. So starting with the connectedness one, um, you can actually see a peer district average comparison. So the district average 3.17 comparison 3.10. That would be one of those moments where I'd say we're performing comparable to peer districts. Yes, we're seven hundredths over, but it's within that plus or minus 0.2. So we're not gonna say, ooh, hey, everybody, like, let's all celebrate. Like, it's, it's actually, we're performing within um, and what would be comparable to peer districts. Um, so again, as we look at that one, yep. Um, can I, uh, and maybe you've shared this with us in the past, but could you share, do you know the names of some of the peer districts? Um, I, that we're compared to? I don't know the peer districts because it, um, it changes from year to year depending on enrollment size, enrollment demographics, okay. those sorts of pieces. So Are they I all within know. the state? Uh, yeah. School Perceptions is primarily Wisconsin, yes. Yeah. Okay, okay, and I guess that's maybe a conversation we're gonna have because I remember Hillary bringing this up last year based on a conference she attended that um, other districts have used peer districts um, that look more like them but they may not fall within our state. So we might be looking at, you know, I think you even had some examples and, and maybe Hillary, you should take over from here, but uh, some international <laughs> comparisons, but also just comparisons to districts and other states. I just want to make sure I captured what you yeah. shared with us last year correctly. I'm not sure though with this survey if that would be comparable, if it would be possible because we're do basing this off of the same, que the same yeah. questions, right. right? So that I do, yeah, for some other peer districts to look at, um, yeah. Um, so as we look at connectedness, what I wanted to dive into and kind of show you was the five questions that fall underneath the connectedness index. Um, and so you can see those, again, going similar to what we did with our um, community and our um, parent or our staff survey, highlights and areas for growth. Um, interesting enough here, we have a highlight, my classmates care about me. Again, focusing in on that character and citizenship piece um, that you just heard about. Um, and then an area for growth or lowest performing area. I feel comfortable participating in this class, which performed equally as low as I feel like I belong at this school. And we talked a lot about belongingness um, with our staff at the start of this year and hopefully making sure that all of our students get that sense of belonging when we see a sense of belonging that's one of the things that our youth risk behavior assessment would say when a student feels like they belong there's less of a chance of going after risky behaviors it also helps increase academic mastery right and so when i feel like i belong i move from r4 over to r2 with that academic mastery piece they go hand in hand. 
Um, and then the other one was the citizenship. Um, here again, district average 3.12 with a comparison 3.13. Again, within that plus or minus 0.2. Um, and so as we look at those, there's four questions um, and a highlight and an area for growth. Highlight, I help others when I see a need. And analysis, I plan ahead and make good choices. And here we're gonna look to um, many of our schools looking at goal setting processes with students, which is a really interesting um, kind of connection with a sense of belonging, right? So if we sit down and set goals with students and help students set their own goals, we're also taking time to sit down and talk with kids and increase their sense of belonging. So these are not separate things, and that's really important to make sure that we're not looking at doing a silo of wellness and a silo of character and citizenship. These are things that we can do in conjunction with each other. So when we sit down to goal set, there may be some, some personal conversation within that goal setting in order to help maintain and increase those goals and meet those goals that students are setting. And can you remind me, when the students do this, are they doing this in school or at home? Like they're for they're school, school. sort of usually in doing school. it in, in school. 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 Yep. Yeah. Okay. And how long does it take approximately? Um, the student one takes approximately 15 minutes, um, depending on 15 minutes, I would say, is probably around the mark for high school students. It might take slightly longer for some of our fourth grade students, um, but right around that 15, 20 mark. We typically do it after uh, our forward testing is complete. Um, once the kind of we've gotten through the spring push of all the testing, then we um, finish up the year with a survey analysis. So they're reflecting on the full academic year. And so, um, what are, or what have, I don't know, what are the plans for sharing kind of the survey data with the groups that participated? Um, so we obviously have this, and then what we would do is we'd highlight these pieces and include this piece on our website so that we can share all, all those pieces. Um, we have uh, done some of the analysis with a lot, with our staff members, okay. but again, then the next piece would then be to include that on our is the staff participation lower than previous, or lower than we hoped? I just saw um, that, I think I saw 55% in here. I believe when I looked at the number, it was similar to what we had last year. Um, it's important to note that this is sent to all staff members, up to including aides, teachers, custodial staff. Um, so I believe that's right around where we were at last year as well. Yeah, and I did notice that, and I'm glad to see the classroom participation. And I hope we explain to all of our other, you know, aides and support staff and everyone that their feedback is also really mm -hmm. valuable and wanted. Yep. Because some of those numbers are quite, quite low. We do send out multiple, multiple reminders, as well as include it in all of our staff updates from principals. So we do try to make sure that we're sending out lots and lots of updates as much as possible. Or a parent or community member, you also got the three to five updates from School Perceptions as well as Dr. Davis when he sent out those Indian Campus updates. So we're we're pushing um, to get as many as we can because we want as many as we can. Okay, thank you. Yep. So um, you're not you're not going to talk about each of those the other slides next time, right? Because that's the summary. This first one was the summary of all of that. Yep, I'm okay. providing you a summary. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. I just wanted, I thought it was interesting in, in this student survey, um, I don't know if you noticed this, but when you look at the fourth grade to 12th grade trend mm -hmm. on almost, on a lot of things, it's, it's kind of downward wellness index mm -hmm. in particular. Um, this is students talking about the, their own wellness, I guess. Yeah. But I mean, it's not our district alone, it's all the comparison districts as well. And I just, I just find that interesting. And even academic and career planning <laughs> kind of goes uh, down over time, mm -hmm. whereas you'd think it would, you know, plans would firm up yep. as you <laughs> get closer. Um, but that's honest, I guess. People are maybe being more realistic. I just thought that's that's interesting. But those those changes from like, like maybe a three point three down to a three, that's really not. If we're, if we're still talking about yeah. point two being yeah. significant, so it's maybe not really meaningful, the, the amount of change there. And, and these are questions, these are set by school perceptions, right? These are not things that we want to change. 
Um, so we do. So many of them are set by school perception. So we start with their base. Right. We do add a few. The difficult part is if we change a school perceptions question, we no longer can compare it to the, to the right. peer districts, which makes it really difficult mm -hmm. to say much of anything about it. Yeah. Um, so for instance, how are we doing is something that school perceptions comes to us and says, so what do you want to know that sh how you're doing on? Um, because there's not necessarily a specific school to s or peer to peer comparison. You're asking some district specific questions that you want to know. Right. Okay. I was just thinking about this question about what do you plan to do immediately after high school graduation and I just noticed there's no option for a gap year or something. That's mm -hmm. one of the response options or, or maybe nobody answered that. But I know a bunch of people who are doing it. So that one is based heavily off of the um, state mandated academic and career planning. Okay. Um, which would that, quite honestly, that program would not support a gap year. Oh. Um, they're pushing for students to make sure that they're planning accordingly to either go to work or go to, go to college right away. Okay. So that is that those questions are based off of ACP academic and career planning. Okay, thanks. Yep. That's helpful. So that's why. Even though we do do a senior survey, so we could add that to that. Right, we still do our senior service, yep. mm -hmm. so we could put that on. We know what people are doing. Yes. Well, and then you wonder, does the, I'm not sure, cash all the, is that the, <laughs> is that the unintended? Right. It's almost 10%. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Further questions about the survey? The only other thing that I noticed with, for the staff one, and I um, was going to ask it actually when we talk about uh, the wellness work group is, um, and I think this is probably all adults, like there was a significant number of uh, people who responded to the staff one that said they don't get enough sleep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which I was like, oh, that's probably everybody. Um, but we talked about including, doing some employee wellness initiatives this year, and mm -hmm. so I'd be interested to hear, because I guess it's for you, Brian, mm -hmm. to hear kind of what the plans are for that, so. Yep. Nap rooms are. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I could think big. Um, okay, so. Um, right. The one other thing I noticed uh, with the student survey was mm -hmm. this issue um, with the question is which, of any, if any, of the following resources has helped you decide what you want to do as a career? And I think it's great that, you know, parents and teachers are the top two things there. Friends are also up there. I was, uh, I just noticed that school counselors were uh, at 44%, which they're obviously contributing um, and I just am wondering if that's something we want to encourage school counselors to focus on a little more mm -hmm. or um, if that's if that is strikes you as well or not given what they're supposed to be doing yep and so again kind of going back to that academic and career planning one of the um, uh, pieces that we put forward when academic and career planning came through um, was utilizing a program called Naviance a bit more um, and looking at uh, career pathways. Um, we're, we talk about careers in sixth grade um, and that's where ACP technically is mandated to start. Um, so our counselors will talk to students about careers but it's on a very 30,000 foot view yeah. level. Um, the, the balance is making sure that we're focusing on careers and letting kids know what's out there as well as not forcing them to choose yeah. Yeah. at the age of 12. Um, and so we're, we're walking a, a tight line of trying to make sure that we give kids an opportunity to look at careers out there and we do do that through Naviance. Um, there's a few um, programs that kids can walk through that we um, have kind of lib um, systematized mm -hmm. si so that six is tied to seventh grade, seventh grade is tied to eighth grade mm -hmm. and they're starting with a very large funnel of career pathways that they're looking at and starting to narrow mm -hmm. all the way until we get to the junior counselor um, meeting where they're actually meeting to talk about what are you going to do after mm -hmm. high school and how can we help make sure that you're ready for it. So is that college, is that career? Um, so those all narrow down to that final meeting. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it I guess it makes sense that, uh, I mean, they, they're interacting with parents and teachers every single day that the school counselors would be less, less often. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And it'd be intriguing to see that data broken down by like fourth graders, graders right. compared That's to 11th and 12th saying. graders. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and see if there's an increase in, in counseling uh, yeah. support there because obviously at the elementary level our counselors are focused more on the SEL piece right. than they are right. the other side. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Yep. So there's a lot to celebrate. 
Yeah, this. absolutely. There's, I mean, tremendous responses on communications, on uh, things that we know that we need to work on, facilities, technology, those are things we've targeted. Um, so as I, as I read and I reread, I started looking at it and I, I kind of took off the lens of the other districts that were that are considered our peers. Um, kind of uh, looking, for instance, um, if we compare the elementaries with the intermediate and the high school, uh, the intermediate school fares uh, pretty low in terms of personalizing instruction to meet the child's needs versus the elementaries that are, at least the parents' perception is about 80% that those teachers and, and curricula meet their child's needs, personalized um, instruction to meet their needs in the high school is about 68%, whereas the middle school is at like 52. And even though that may fall within like the acceptable range compared to our peers, I still think it's something that maybe we kind of draw a closer eye to. Mm -hmm. So a um, couple other thoughts. One, um, when we broke it down by different um, academic areas, social studies, foreign languages, music, art, uh, how is your office going to use this? So if we see that, you know what, there's a strong perception among not just the students, but also the community and, and maybe faculty that some areas are consistently drawing lower numbers. Um, what what then is the plan uh, with that? And then I have another one, but I'll wait. To sure. So typically what I'm doing is looking at the, and what you're specifically referring to is how important is X and then how are we doing with mm -hmm. that same. Um, and so what we're looking at is we're looking at those and identifying where are those coming up within our next curriculum cycle? Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes what we've actually seen is that those gaps in between how we're doing and the perception of what's going on start to decrease as we go through curriculum renewals. Mm -hmm. At the same time, if that's not happening, that's a point in time where we can start to dig into that and identify is it happening at a specific school? Is it happening at a specific level? Where is that going? I can sit down with principals and teachers and start to put those pieces together as to what's the perception here, what's going on, um, how do we make sure that um, what we're doing, is it really just a perception or is it a reality, right? And those are two really important questions. Is this is a school perception survey. So if it's a perception that things aren't happening, then we need to do something about that. But if it's really not happening, then we need to look at bringing that curriculum back up and saying, so what's going on? We're not being successful. Um, and so that's typically what we're doing is we're driving into that data to see what levels that's happening at, where is that um, identifying itself, and I'm sitting down with principals and teachers. Okay. Yeah, that's important that discussion happens. Yep. It doesn't need to happen here, but that's for you all to, to, to do with this data, these data. And my second question has to do also kind of looking along the lines of comparing, and while we may be statistically even significantly higher than other districts, I'm looking at, um, a thought popped into my head when, when um, when Lance brought up the idea of disaggregating uh, the non-parents, mm -hmm. you know, into different categories, I'm wondering if we want to do the same thing with the staff, you know, by administration, by teachers, by aides, by custodial, to see kind of where the different groups fall. We absolutely do that. We do. Yes. Okay. We don't see that here. Though. Correct. Okay. I, I we have the ability to do that. Okay. So that having the ability, I think I, you know, next year would be interesting to see that breakdown. And one of the things, we, we, we scored really high on, um, you know, on, on uh, the perception that, that staff have of, of the direction the district's going in, of their, their faith in, in our superintendent and our administrators, and, and, and all those are high. Then we, we drop down a bit when it looks at, um, there was one category that had to do with the amount of work. Mm -hmm. Right, and I realize we're all overburdened. You know, right now I could easily be doing a hundred other things that are work related. Um, but I want to keep an eye on that, along with the line, along the lines of what Paro was saying about wellness. You know, with with our most important asset, which mm -hmm. are our you know people who work here, uh, administrators, um, custodians, and teachers, and aides, and everyone. Um, so, to get to my question. <laughs> um, Keeping in mind, I have not had my question yet, I'm just sharing this, with, with like pay, right? Mm -hmm. um, the pay, the perception that we, we get paid well for what we do, 
um, it's statistically in that range, if not maybe a little higher than others. I just want to keep our district to keep an eye on that because other districts and the pay for, for teachers is going down across the state. It has gone down over the last nine years. I just look at my the contributions I, I now have to make as a, as a state, as a public educator um, that I have to now make into the WRS and into my insurance, which is significantly higher than I ever had to before Act 10. Um, I just want to keep an eye on that because it's not that we're going to be losing, according to the survey, we're not going to be losing to people to neighboring districts, to the competing districts. But I just want to make sure that we at least recognize, and, and I know we're doing stuff, we're on the right track here, um, but I, I am concerned that we're comparing ourselves to kind of a sinking ship sure. on those points. The other points, everything's, I mean, I'm, I'm always really impressed with the, the results. I just want to be careful that we're not just tying ourselves to everybody else and sinking and saying, we're statistically a little bit better than they are, and that's good enough. Okay. Yeah, there was no question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Point check. Is our, our, I, guess, I guess my question would be, just to wrap that around to Brian, like, are you guys keeping an eye on-, on Bring it home, Pablo, come on. Well, th this is significant. This is significant. This is really, really, um, you know, when I see that, you know, it's a three point something in terms of how I'm getting paid or this and that. Yes. This kind of speaks to what we talked to a couple meetings ago where it's hard for us to look at how we, how we compare to other, we can't compare ourselves to private sector, right, because right. of the differences. And your point is we, c we can only compare to peer districts so much because maybe, maybe we aspire to do something different than what they do. Right. Yeah, you have a, a whole OE, OE 10 is uh, personnel yeah. administration, so that, that covers this, this area. So that, that's something that, that's baked into the, um, the comparisons and, and uh, that type of thing. So. Tim, do we track any longitudinal kind of year to year looking at, mm -hmm. okay, but we just don't have that share of concern. I just, do we look for trends in terms of declines that way? That would get it. That would get it some of right. Right. So as of right now, we have two years worth of data. Right. Okay. Um, so we have so last year and this year. Yep. So year, yeah. could yep. we form a trend line? Yes, but okay. it wouldn't be a very good one. It would just be connecting to two dots. Right. Um, right. So as we continue on, yes, yes. we'll get more okay. and more data and we can start the trend line that. Okay. It's just right now those trend lines are small. So we well, they're two points. They're not trend lines yet. And we talked about that meetings ago where next year we'll be able to look at the seniors from three years ago two years ago and this year right. and in an addition to looking at this year's students from fourth to twelve. Right. But yeah. Do the sorry, do the peer <coughs> districts um, stay consistent across the students, the staff and the community? Like are we you know for each survey are we just looking at five the same five peer districts or are they take do I'm not asking this very nicely. But, you know, I understand. So, do we have the same peer district from year to year? And, well, not, for not just year survey. to year, but each for survey. each, you know, for the student survey, for the staff survey, for the parent community surveys, are those peer districts for us, you know, for the whole conglomeration of surveys, or is it separate peer districts for each? By, I by, don't by each participant category? By each. I don't think so. No, survey you're category. Yeah, so does the parent community peer district, peer yeah. community, match the peer community for the staff, yes. match the peer for the for students. students yes. I don't know. Um, I can find out that information. I think we asked this before, I mean, yes. of uh, Bill and Sue, and it's not the, not it's not the population same. that's the peer, it's the district's peers, so they would be the same. They would be the same. Right, because they're looking at enrollment right. mm -hmm. and year size year of the district. Right. Year to year, it could change. Year to year, probably will right. change. Right. Um, right. But right. I, I, you, no more than I, I can figure that out. I don't know that off the top of my head. Yeah, I think we asked this before. Yeah, and that's why I was thinking I kind of knew that it was the same, but yet it did differ depending. So. Mystery district. Yeah. Somewhere out there. As are we to some other right. districts, mm -hmm. right? Right. Yeah, some so of these we might be messing with their numbers. Right. Our numbers. We're yeah. outperforming them. So um, <laughs> this is a question for you, um, Brian. So when do we get this data back? Uh, so we take, take it at the end of the year? Uh, yes, yeah, so we take it uh, we take it at the end of April. Um, um, 
the staff one we take right after we come back from spring break, get them some feedback from April. staff members. They wanted April. it a little bit earlier in the year because there was a lot of things going on at the end of the year that they just preferred to have it a little bit earlier. Um, and then we give the student and parent and community one near the end of the academic year that usually falls somewhere in the middle of May to late May um, and ends sometimes into June, uh, depending on that. Uh, typically then what they will do is they will run the numbers for us, develop the trend, not develop the trend line, but show us the longitudinal data break down by subgroups um, to give us those reports. We typically don't get those until pretty close to July, um, right around the time that we're ready to start looking at them um, as a team. So they're, they're pretty close to running up right up against <coughs> the beginning of July when we start to look at them and identify what some of our strategic plans, our strategic actions are gonna be around them. Yeah, I guess I'm asking because um, it's apparent that uh, this information was utilized a lot in the creation of the strategic plan. And mm -hmm. so I guess I'm just thinking about like timing, it would make sense probably for us to hear about it prior, you know, like in terms of sequencing, right? Um, since it is either when you talk about the strategic plan and how this kind of fit in or sure. um, since it feels a little bit like these are all the things we're, we've decided to do, right, as a result of the survey. And yeah, we although our strategic it. plan usually, you know, we, we were a little bit late with it this year. Our strategic plan is usually um, you know, something that we would bring a draft for in July, mm -hmm. anyways. So, I, so we we could we could bring it as probably early as you know July August would be the earliest. I think what you're seeing here, to be honest, is us having a really good idea of where what we need to work on and this, the things that. So, f take facilities for example. Like we know we need to work on facilities. We've been working on that for three years. That happens that, sh that shows up as, as an important need here. Um, so I, I think a lot of this at this point is confirmation of, of the strategic plan um, and not necessarily fully driving. I mean, we, we've used it um, within the strategic plan, but I think, I think um, because we've got a pretty good read on where we're at, that's the way that's gone. But if, if you, I guess this is the point that like you want it earlier, well, I guess or, I guess I saw this as driving more of the strategic plan and kind of the decisions make made at the beginning of the school year around what you were talking about with goal setting and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it's right. It's being used in things that are at the beginning of the school year. Um, and so again, it just seems like like the decision like we're hearing about it after the fact, essentially, versus like as you know, as part of that conversation. Yeah, so we could bring it in April or August would be would be the beginning of August, which is when the strategic plan mm -hmm. draft would essentially be completed, and then we would be letting you know what we're planning on doing, along with how it falls within this data. Yeah, is, is that or, I mean, or how this data was relevant to the consideration. Exactly, I think is really the piece. Right, versus con confirm instead of confirmation of what we've decided to do in the strategic plan, and like driving, like what we've decided to do in you know. If yeah, it except for it's not it. going to happen like that because our data is going to be like when we get our data points. I mean, we're getting our data points in July, mm -hmm. so a lot of our, I mean, we're setting staffing and a lot of our programming right, in spring. in the spring. So, okay. well, so really, what so it might be is that you're actually relying on the previous year's data for the spring stuff. Sure, and then right. The summer okay. stuff affirms the decisions that you. Yeah, I see. does that I make see. sense? Yeah, so yeah. It, it's yeah. a little. Yeah, it's a little choppy in okay. there, but yeah. I mean, we okay. can certainly... No, no, that's fine. If that's how, I mean, I guess I see what you're saying. Like, if it's starting, the process is starting prior to that, then yeah. that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, but it's certain, but we'll certainly use, you know, this year's data, last year's data, and, and what we know about this system up to this point to be able to make these decisions. I would assume if there was something that was a big surprise, that right. we would make an adaptation yeah. to whatever Absolutely. we were doing right. to yeah. allow for that. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right, any further questions or discussion? No, I think, uh, thank you, Tim. Thanks. We'll see you Great. back here in a minute. Thanks, um, uh, maybe, so, um, and then we have uh, four work group reports um, from the administration. So the first is from the, um, the equity work group. Yeah, so the uh, equity work group, um, and, and these again are, are posted on uh, online, and so we um, segregated out some work groups that are, are staff related, and then some of the work groups involve 
uh, community members. So the equity um, work group is a group of uh, staff members uh, that essentially provide some perspective on uh, some planning for our uh, race work professional development. So we're in our it's currently in our third year of our race work professional development. The equity work work group. Um, meets uh, two to three times a year essentially to be able to give us feedback on how those sessions have gone and, and allow us to uh, try to land as accurately as we can um, in uh, some meaningful professional development. So, um, so I put um, just a, a brief summary of the work that was done. Uh, so essentially, um, Tim and I and, and uh, some of our administrators had gone through a draft of what we believe from a professional development standpoint based on our surveys from last year, based on the work that um, that we've done, what we think is going to be a, a, a good presentation, uh, and then we throw it in front of the equity work group, and then uh, two hours later we have a much better plan <laughs> um, to go off of, uh, and uh, it's been a really, uh, a really thoughtful and helpful, helpful group. Um, um, that way I'm not standing in front of 300 people giving something that's like, oh boy, you really should have talked about this or that. Um, so, uh, so that's what we've used it for, is to be able to have some staff voice um, specifically for the uh, uh, race work professional development. So that's been really helpful. Um, so we talked about, um, talked about our, our time in August, and then we had feedback based on our surveys uh, in August. Talked a little bit about what we'll be doing in October. Um, some of it's hard to be able to get staff together um, at, as we're on the fly here during the school year. Um, and so uh, we'll likely be meeting um, either before our next professional development in October, uh, but more than likely after that as we're looking at our January session um, and uh, how, we're, uh, how we're moving forward with the, the RaceWork PD. So, uh, so it's been a really, uh, really good, uh, diverse group of people that have uh, some, some really good insight. So it's been a way for us to be able to capture some, some staff voice in, uh, in the professional development. Um, again, we also do surveys after each one of those sessions to be able to collect um, participants information so it, it's not the only um, feedback that we have through the equity work group but it's a really important one so just wanted to be able to provide that for an update thank you any questions no well, um oh. just just want to I, I know you shared the initial results of the um, studies on african-american students and mm -hmm. experiences in the district and i'm sure that the entire district but were you able to have a conversation with the equity work group along those lines um, so we shared the, uh, the part of the presentation that was part of our race work yeah. PD. Um, so it was, it was basically those, those slides and kind of worked through, um, again, what, would, what do they find helpful, um, what might be too much, um, and uh, that type of thing. So, um, so nothing more than, than what uh, the other staff saw at this point. Um, okay, um, English language arts curriculum worker. Well, welcome, welcome back. back. <laughs> <laughs> um, ELA work group consists of myself, uh, our two principals, our two reading interventionists uh, at the elementary level, and um, our authentic learning coordinator. Um, our goal for the 18 19 year is really twofold, um, and that's to improve our reading workshop instruction um, and help teachers to um, self-identify where they need to improve within their instruction then provide them the professional development that they need as well as start to utilize some of the new um, and available resources for teachers through the um, Lucy Culkin's uh, readers workshop materials that they received this year um, so uh, this year, uh, at our first Wednesday early release, um, we had a chance to um, share out with teachers the reading workshop expectations that they collaboratively developed um, at the elementary level the previous year. Um, we re-shared that with them and had them uh, go through a self-evaluation of where they're strong and where they might have an opportunity to learn. And then we actually provided, uh, and are continuing to provide uh, even up to tomorrow, um, some personalized professional development sessions for teachers to attend so if they realize that hey you know what I think I have an opportunity to grow um, in our small group activities during reading workshop um, one of our interventionists is providing that uh, professional development for about 30 to 45 minutes that teachers can then attend there's another session after that that might be about conferring there's another session after uh, the following following week that might be about um, assessment of instruction and then how you use that assessment to um, help students throughout that. So really this month, early this year, which is really important, 
we're trying to um, flood teachers with the professional development that they need in order to increase their instruction in ELA or improve their instruction in ELA for the remainder of the year and they have the tools that they need um, to work on that throughout the year. The other piece of that is that we um, gave students some <coughs> new material, excuse me, gave teachers some new materials from uh, what we call the Lucy Culkins, um, it's, a, it's a form of reader's workshop. Um, so she provides some new materials that teachers are trying out um, and they have kind of either determined that they're all gonna try them out or this teacher is gonna try this unit, another teacher is gonna try a different unit with the idea that next year we'll be able to come together and say, here's the four common ELA units that we're gonna use across all grade levels across both schools, and here's the essential learning outcomes that we are going to guarantee happen from each and every one of those. Um, so we're doing a little bit of piloting this year. Um, no worries, the old materials have the same essential learning outcomes as the new materials. It's essentially which materials do we wanna use that give us the biggest bang for our buck. So as teachers get together, it's going to be, should we use the old text or should we use the new text um, in order to get to our essential learning outcomes by the end of the unit. Um, so there won't be huge gaps in learning because this teacher piloted and this teacher did not pilot. We'll still get to all the um, essential learning outcomes that we have already established for our grade level. Can I ask you uh, what the note catchers are? Yeah, so no catchers, right? So no catchers is something that I walked into at this district that is really a popular term. Uh, no catchers is just another word for an area to take common notes. Um, so it catches all your notes and then you can share them out. So a no catcher for a grade two level um, is a shared document that has all of the um, units on them. And then they share, how did it go? What were the strengths? What were the weaknesses? And then if Joanne is my partner teacher, I can see her notes. We've caught the notes in a common area and I can share my notes with her. It's a note catcher that is then shared by It's like a, a, like a Google Doc? It's a Google Doc. Yeah, uh, I was gonna say, this is. This I was imagining somebody like walking around with you taking notes and I was like, wow. <laughs> mm -hmm. I didn't know we had oh, that. I know, position. it sounds a lot cooler than it actually is. It's just a Google Doc. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a way to share information across. Yep, exactly. Okay. And so the um, ELA work group includes just K-5 through six, but from both schools. Yep. And so is there a different ELA that happens seven through 12? Seven through 12 we did in conjunction with social studies last year through oh, okay. teaching tolerance right, right. and looking at some of our social justice learning standards and applying those. Okay. So this is a heavy focus on K-6 because we did an evaluation of ELA 712 last year. Okay. And so when you say re-adoption, we're already doing this, it's just reevaluating the new materials that come with this particular curricular. Yeah, package. so it's a it's a review, it's a readoption, it's an evaluation. Essentially what we're saying is we're looking at the curriculum right now. Um, it's we're as we talk with teachers, it's important that we remain in a workshop model because it does allow for more personalized instruction within that workshop model. Um, and we do have some buy-in to the workshop model, so it was important that we maintain that. To redo a whole different ELA program is a super big lift, and we believe that we're, we're getting better as we go, so we're readopting. In other words, we're looking at Lucy Culkins again and trying to increase um, kind of our own skills within that, so that's why I would call it a readoption if you the Lucy Culkins stuff that we have been doing. We just need another boost um, to make sure that we're all aligned. And are we looking at that because we actually believe that that's a good program as yes. opposed to because it's too heavy? Okay, no. I hear that it's a heavy lift. And no. It's like that's not a reason not to do no, it. No, 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 no. It's no, no. a research the, base. The, yeah. It's okay. the best. It's clear. for it's sure one of the most popular ways of, of doing okay. ELA instruction that is and very most much research based. And most effective. And most effective. Yeah. Absolutely. Most important and most effective. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Any further questions on ELA? Okay, um, and then response RTI, response intervention work group? Yep, and so we actually met this morning. Um, and so we uh, plugged away at uh, our top two questions that we're looking at for the academic year. We touched base um, on SSIS and how that's going. Um, there, was, there wasn't much of an update because we haven't started anything as of yet. Um, we've gotten the materials, we've done, uh, our counselors have done some um, webinars with it. Um, but they do have some questions that they'd like to bring back in October as they start to plan small group instruction. 
what are those small group instruction groups going to look like? How will we identify to make sure we have a consistent format across the districts? So those are the di those are the questions that they wanted to bring back in our October meeting. So then we dove into the advanced learning um, goals. What are the shared goals uh, of advanced learning? And we pulled actually the first page of our advanced learning handbook, which is a pretty exhaustive, lengthy page. And what we really wanted to get it down to was some concrete statements. So get rid of the educational jargon. Let's really state what we're about and make sure that it also contains the why of advanced learning. So concrete language and the why and that, like, let that ride. Um, so we went and took it, what was almost a one and a half page document, it got down to about a half page of this is what we believe and this is what we're gonna do because we believe in this. Um, and so those are marinating now that we have kind of come down to those with the RTI work group team. That team consists of myself, um, the director of special ed and pupil services, both school psychologists, counselors, teachers, interventionists, and principals. It's a pretty large group um, that's going through RTI. Um, and again, our focus this year is going to be on making sure that we continuously revisit um, the behavioral SSI, SSIS intervention um, that we decided on last year, as well as looking at advanced learning. Once we complete those two, we'll loop back around to academic intervention. Once we kind of reevaluate academic intervention, then we'll loop back around to behavioral intervention, then loop over to advanced learning and keep on going between those three. So our work will never be done. We'll just keep on going back to those three facets of RTI. Um, can I ask about the role of the Dean of Students in RTI? Um, I didn't, you didn't mention them, and I just was wondering, are they, I mean, are they part of the work group or are they not considered kind of included, not included? We haven't had them as part of the work group because they haven't been here. Um, the other piece is just making sure that we have someone at the building. So when we pull a counselor mm -hmm. and a principal yeah, sure. and a dean, we're pulling a lot of people from the building. Um, it's not that uh, similar to when we have teachers, right? So if we have a few teachers on the RTI group, work group, we don't have all teachers, right, sure. but we need all teachers to participate. So the goal is when you come to the RTI work group, yes, you're getting information, but then your job is to disseminate that information to key stakeholders to make sure. So it's not that the Dean of Students doesn't play a role in some of the um, interventions that we're providing, but typically what we're trying to do, our key players are gonna be our principal and our counselor within those behavior pieces. So for that team to then sit down and talk about how are we gonna make SSIS work? What does the Dean need to take on in order for that to work? What does the counselor need to take on? What's well, why don't you talk about these three different kind of components, three different off of a central spoke, right? So I, presumably if you need the Dean of Students involved when you're doing the SSIS, they participate in yep. that piece, but not necessarily in the others. Yep, and that happens on, on a pretty routine basis. So what I try to do each year is say, here's our goals for the year. If you feel like you need to cycle off of the RTI work group, that's great, let me and your principal know because that way we both know which stakeholder has stepped off so we can get a similar step uh, stakeholder into that work group. So if a teacher from Lake Bluff steps off, we wanna get a Lake Bluff teacher back on so that we have that voice at the table. How do you ensure the dissemination of information back? Um, it's pretty evident if things are not being disseminated back because the processes aren't lining up. Um, so it's, it's pretty easy to identify if messages aren't 99% of the time, they're getting back. Okay. And then can I ask about advanced learning? Um, is there uh, an opportunity in, in the next month or so, or is there a plan to have the advanced learning department like present to parents about what they do and how to get involved? Yeah, we do three information sessions each year. Um, our first one is coming up in October. The date, I think, is the 8th. Okay, so it's on the calendar. On that. Um, it'll be on our advanced learning website. So typically at the first one, what we're gonna do is just kind of every year we like to say, here's what advanced learning is, here's the programs that we offer, here's how you access them. Um, it's kind of the same presentation over sure. and over because we want new parents to know and understand and start from square one. So that one we're encouraging um, parents who are interested in advanced learning or newer parents to advanced learning to come to that so we can go through those. Um, and then Sam and I look at, uh, Sam has been working heavily with some of the counselors um, on um, wellness initiatives within advanced learning. So our second one will focus and we'll bring our counselors to that second informational session 
um, to folks on wellness within the advanced learning um, department and advanced learning students and how we can help advanced learning students with those pieces. And then the last one, um, we have been asked by parents if they can just have some time to sit down and talk about resources um, that they found, that Sam has found, and just have a share out of here's different things that we've used with our kids. Um, so we want to provide that near and closer to the summertime so that when parents are looking for, well, what am I going to do with my, with my child over the next three months, there's some resources that they can have. Okay. Those will be the three that we've looked at. This <coughs> and so that first meeting will be, is going to be um, announced to everybody? Yep. Okay. Absolutely. So you, you have two goals listed. If you state that you have three goals for the year, it says this year we have three goals, and there's actually four goals. Um, so the the first goal is to make sure that we're checking in on SSIS, and then there's three goals for advanced learning. Sorry, so I noticed that as well. So behavioral <laughs> intervention, advanced learning. So each of the bullet bullet points. Bullet points, points under advanced learning is a goal. Oh. Any way you cut it, it's mm -hmm. definitely an error on my part. <laughs> Not a big deal, I just caused the two, like, <laughs> three and I saw so two yep. explicitly listed. Right. You say two, I say four. There you go. Okay, any other questions? We'll let Tim get up for another minute and come back. Um, all right, and then um, our last work group presentation is on the technology work group. I was here last week. May have been actually. <laughs> so uh, our, our group actually met uh, Tuesday. Yes, last Thursday. Sorry, um, time's flying here. Uh, just oh, yeah. to uh, to we went through the entire plan just to get updated with where we were at, um, and then uh, talk about where we're going forward here. And really, what what it's boiled down to is it's not the technology plan that you see that we want to move forward with, it's the technology plan of using technology within the classroom is the plan that we, it's uh, I guess phase, the last part of it. There's a phase, the part that we created, um, which is what we essentially would have had to report back to the state in the past years, and then this plan as we go forward is how it's going to be implemented. And that's what the uh, work group really is starting to focus on. Um, we're going to be meeting every month uh, going forward here. Uh, to continue to uh, chunk away at different parts of where the teachers think that what we need to do. This also includes creating what they feel is, is needed as a digital curriculum um, that's uh, K-12, so we know where kids are at and where they need to go as they progress through our uh, school district. So the uh, work group is the, not the same as the pilot group that's um, piloting the um, iPads, right, in the classroom? Correct. The pilot group is invited to the work group, okay. um, and we would like to get their input uh, uh, so the work group has that background knowledge. So they can bring it forward um, and have a more uh, better insight as to what else we need to do. Okay. When you talk about the, um, you know, assessing where students are, I mean, I think that's probably one of the challenges is once you realize where, where there are gaps, differentiation amongst students, I mean, how do we deal with evening that playing field, right? Is this a, an RTI piece in terms of deficits, and how do we, I mean, that to me could seem to be like, it could be a huge, not, do we have to do something in summers? Do we, like, how do we factor that into this? Just with the, in the technology piece alone? Yeah. Do you mean as far as having access to resources or knowledge? Even once they have access, having knowledge. Okay. I think we assume that there's a universality, and I think that's a misapprehension. That's absolutely a misapprehension. Um, that is a huge factor, or a huge piece that the group keeps coming back to, is that we are assuming these kids know how to <coughs> use Google Docs. We're assuming the kids know right. how to use a website, and really they don't. And so we're, we're all, and it's not just a specific age group of teachers, it's all teachers from the elementary level through the high school assume the kids come in with this knowledge and how to do something, and they give them an assignment with that assumption, and really nothing's right. there. Uh, so that is a task that we are definitely looking at. Um, I mean, really, without having somebody that's just specifically teaching digital technology, um, it's going to be a real tough, tough nut to us. Uh, I mean, is that something we end up having to do essentially online for? I mean, self, self direct. I don't know. I mean, 
like that's a really that's a huge question to me as I was reading through this. Are we going to have the best technology plan? We can have teachers ready to deliver it, but if we don't have students ready to receive it, it doesn't matter. Yeah, and I think that's that's what the work group will help define as we're yeah. moving forward because they're closest with with students between that between that formal work group and their experiences with kids maybe or maybe not having you know a lot of access to technology and the information that we can glean from the pilots and from this year and next year I think that's that's certainly something to keep our eye on but I think that's an evolution I'm not sure we can really define that right now other than just knowing that that's that that's a concern and that that will be then rolled into this plan as as we would uh, move it forward I had a question about um See, according to the summary, you got to parts one and two, but not implementation yet. So that's what you're going to talk about at the next meeting. So uh, throughout that time, there uh, in the meeting, uh, as things different parts were coming up, I eventually said, okay, that's on page 26. That's kind of what I'm referring back to right now. Uh, page 26 is a blank page on the technology plan, <laughs> <laughs> and every single person there flipped it to page 26, and I said, that's what we have to do here because that is what we're missing right now. Um, so as we started talking, I said, okay, so here's piece one, and it was over an hour into it. I said, I think at this time, let's table that and let's come back next time and bring all these things together so we can start putting these pieces in place so we can start letting out what the final piece of the technology plan is. Yeah, I mean, because I know that the keyboarding is one of the things that has come up now, right, multiple times. And to me, this is, again, like one of the ways in which students are, have skills, the skills necessary to use the technology that we're providing them. Um, and so um, I'd be interested to hear, right, I mean, I think this is one of the things, you're right, this group's going to have to grapple with in terms of how to move forward. Right. So. And then when you talk about appropriate device for the appropriate needs, that mm -hmm. also is predicated on access. I mean, there's just, it's so complicated. It, uh, I told Brian today in our meeting that uh, this really could be a 200-page document if yeah. we really sat down with it, and uh, so we really have to have to get more of an umbrella of yeah. as we go through this. Yeah. I think the good thing at this point is that there's there's a definition of what where we want to head, what we want to be able to do yeah. with it, um, having some kind of sustainable budget um, process of replacement and having a skeleton of that because what's going to happen is that there'll likely be implementation um, needs and desires and things we'd want to do and then that'll have to be brought back to this plan where it is right now and say okay well there are limitations right and we need to have a sustainable plan it needs to make sure that it's it's still meeting our needs and our purpose or what we had originally thought you know so we don't get way off the rails on, on some kind of implementation um, rabbit holes so um, you know I, I think it's at a, a good foundational spot now um, and then it's just going to be Mickey's leadership and leadership of the tech team and the pilots to be able to just continue to, to work through it. Um, I think when we had met last time, we said we wanted Mickey to come back in February just for an update on what the, what the pilots have taught us um, for the first semester and, and kind of where that group is. So I think that'll be an informative time to be able to, to come back and begin to see some of those pieces fall into place. How many times has the work group met? This is the first meeting of this. So we may, June, July, and now, now here. So, so you four have consistency times. in the same group of people that are meeting. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much the same group. We've had a couple new ones join us, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. And that, they're going to continue to encourage that. But even those people that uh, have not been able to join us due to other things that are going on, um, I have reached out to everyone and said, if you'd like to meet either individually or as a group, uh, let me know, I'll make some time uh, to fit in your schedule and we can talk about whatever we need to that you see here. Um, I, would, I would really support that we take a very slow approach to this because I think you're right that it's very complicated and that, that the, the biggest mistake we can make is, is just to try and silver bullet this and say, this will be great. And then it's all about teaching and how to make teaching more effective and how to make kids more effective learners. And if we have to slow it down because we have to pilot and tweak and pilot and tweak, I'm totally okay with that. There's no doubt that it'll be a slow process. Yeah. There's no well, it's, it's, it goes to being important. fast and, and spending Absolutely. money ir irresponsibly are way too great. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um,
Um, okay, and then uh, next up are, um, are some district policy updates by our favorite presenter, Tim Joint. We should require that you oh, change hello. your tie oh, hello. or something. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I doing this? <laughs> <laughs> um, two main ones uh, that, that we're kind of looking at, we can um, lump uh, into groups of two. Um, so as you look at uh, 454 and 450.2, so that's Emergency Nursing Services and Guideline Administering Medication to Students Doc. Um, that one I redlined, so if you actually scroll through, you can actually see the redline updates. Um, and legitimately the key piece there is we have to have a policy in order to have um, uh, naloxone, um, Narcan on, on our site. Um, and so for um, the safety of not just our students, but of community members, um, we believe that this would be something that we can um, have on site. Yes, fire department has it. Sometimes they can be on call and it might take a little bit longer. So yep. hopefully we never have to use it, but um, in Are terms of just being either? safe and watching out for our students, Since the nurse that would be in charge of that owner. Correct. Okay. Is there anybody else besides the nurse in this instance where the nurse might not be available? I believe the nurse's aides may have some training. I'd have to double check with her. Okay. And just for the sake of discussion, I mean, I don't know how this fits within the, the school uh, structure, but, you know, it's possible anybody can get trained by the North Shore Health Department yep. and learn um, how to use naloxone and get a supply of it. Um, so you don't have to be a nurse or a right. professional at all to use that. And there's the Good Samaritan law that protects you. And I would assume the school district. Um, and it's better to, and it, you know, it doesn't doesn't hurt people to use it. It's not the right call, but anyway, it's um, I don't know how that fits in. So if some of your staff have have that training. Yep, and we work with the North Shore Fire Department when it comes to our CPR training annually as well. Okay. Um, so we can work with them again uh, if we're interested in people who'd like to get, uh, to get trained. So okay. I'm sure that's something that we've always had a very good working relationship with. Mm -hmm. so. uh, the other two uh, are around um, the Early College Credit Program, for, formerly known as Youth Options, now known as ECCP. If I could so options now called uh, ECCP, Early College Credit Program, as well as our distance learning. Um, so if you look at the executive summary, um, I tried to walk you through some of the changes. So we have to change our youth options policy, which is now out of date. We need to change, update that to um, the Early College Credit Program. Um, so where I pulled, uh, this is actually a, a real, I didn't do a red line because there wasn't a red line. It needed to be overhauled completely. Um, and so where I pulled that actu actually from is uh, WASB's um, recommendations um, and then added in our dates. Uh, the other piece that I did add in that's important uh, to note is that um, both in the ECCP as well as the distance learning, um, I've added a portion where uh, anything taken outside of Shorewood School District would show up as a pass-fail grade on the transcript. And I want to make sure that that's really clear as to why I'm suggesting that. And the reason I'm suggesting that is twofold. One, as students begin to take upper level classes um, at college and collegiate universities, I don't want them to feel like they can't take those courses for fear of, I might get a lower grade. Um, and that'll affect my GPA on my transcript. As well as, and this is more in particular with our distance learning, um, online education is becoming more and more prevalent and there's more and more options 
for students out there. And what's getting more and more difficult for me is parents and students coming and saying, I'd like to take this online program, will you transcribe it? And I have very little information to base whether that is a rigorous or non-rigorous curriculum. So whereas I can ensure the learning outcomes and the grading practices within Charlotte School District, I can't ensure the grading practices nor the rigor in a different institution. So the reality of the situation is I'd like to put pass fail because it will force um, parents and students to put in their transcripts from the other institution, which we already ask parents to do. If you're taking courses at UW-Milwaukee, I want you to include that UW-Milwaukee transcript in your application for colleges and any other place where you need it. So that's why I'm encouraging the pass-fail because it decreases the amount of stress put on students to take more rigorous curriculum as well as gives us the ability to say, I can control this, I can't control that, and sometimes for me to have to make a, quite honestly, game time decision where parents are saying, I need to sign up for this tomorrow and you need to tell me if this biology class is gonna count or not, and I'm going, I've got three learning outcomes and what the company is telling me. And so that, that's a difficult one for me to, to go through. Um, lastly, course options um, is turning to um, part-time open enrollment. Many districts don't have policy around part-time open enrollment because it is so legislated by the part-time open enrollment um, procedures that it doesn't actually meet a policy requirement. So whereas our early college credit program, it will say you can earn up to as many credits as school policy allows, which is usually 18. Um, there isn't that stipulation within the part-time open enrollment, so we really don't need it. It's just an additional piece that we have when it was course option. So those are my suggestions for those um, district policies. Um, Tim, I just want to say I agree with the pass-fail piece as a parent who's had kids go all the way through and that whole evaluation process, it's really incumbent on the accepting institution to make that determination and not on us. And I think we have, it's much better to put that in, in their camp. And they can, they make all the, they look at our grades anyways, they recalculate grade points to take out weighting. They, there's all sorts of stuff that happens at the collegiate level when they're reviewing it and, and it's better for them to make that determination. I had a question about the distance, or, or the online classes. So. Yep. Um, there isn't like a list of accredited um, programs or colleges or schools like either through DPI. I mean, I, it sounds like if I want to take, you know, I could like start searching myself for I want to take genetics, and I'm just going to look and see which one seems like the cheapest or the best. I mean, how I don't understand. I guess how we're evaluating that. Yeah. So one of the things uh, prior to was an accreditation. It needed to be an accredited um, company. Uh, an accredited institution um, that had somewhat of the equivalent in the link within the curriculum. Um, so what we don't want to get into is, I'm going to take geometry online and I'm done in two weeks. <laughs> okay. Khan Academy. Like, like what happened here, unless, there, like, unless we missed out on an advanced learning opportunity that we should have been looking at, like there's a rigor issue here. Um, and so we have been looking at accreditation. Um, so the problem is, is there's no list where people are going through and saying, here's what's good and here's what's bad, because you're getting into a sticky situation of trying to determine and making those determinations of what's good and what's bad. So I typically try to walk parents through as they're looking for what should I be looking at. Here are some institutions that have come across my desk that have seemed okay. And then every now and then I get, hey, I found University of Nebraska sports, rad kids, um, online institution, would you accept it? And I'm going, show me the central learning outcomes, show me the curriculum. And sometimes those institutions aren't super willing to share their curriculum because it's their, their magic within that proprietary course that they're like, well, I don't really want to share that with you because then you have it. Um, and so that's the difficult part when it comes to online. It's this whole new wild, wild west of education. I'm surprised that DPI it. hasn't like tried to put their hand in this though and said like you have to, you know, we're only gonna, I mean just given the other things that they're willing to mandate, yeah. like you can only be from these five places or something like that. And so, I mean, cause I think the, my concern would be that they take this class at University of Nebraska 
I mean, is it possible that you could take it and then it would come back and they're like, well, actually, it's not gonna like it's not good enough. Like, for me? For, yeah, for I'm us. I'm typically trying to make that determination before they get into it. But it, could it happen after the fact or no? If I'm making a determination before, so then once I'm not going to go. Once the school district has signed off on it, it's fine. It's going to go on the transcript. It's at that point, I don't feel comfortable looking at it and saying, well, actually, it right. turns out you didn't learn anything, and now I'm going to take it off your transcript. Right. Like, that's that's not, a, it's not a good place to be in. Um, so typically, that's why I'm suggesting that we move to the pass fail because I can, I can tell you here's what it is. My concern and what I and what Sam and I have talked about at at length is if you want to take courses for advancement, we also need to have a plan in place for what happens if you didn't get what you needed. Um, so if you take biology online, so this is a near and dear concern to me is when we do online science, which are all lab courses. Oftentimes, we're not doing laboratory experiences on online courses. Mm -hmm. So what happens if you get you advance through biology, you get to chemistry, and you're going, I am really lost? We need to have a legitimate plan in place for, so what's going to happen? Are you going to be OK with going back to biology and, and learning that, mm -hmm. that piece again? And I want to have that plan in place before we go into a distance learning opportunity so that we have those plans ready for kids and parents that we go, we know what we can do, we have a plan, we already did that piece. So that's part of what we're working on. What we want to do is get the policy first, and then Sam and I will work on the actual application piece, which will include a, so what happens if it doesn't work. Sam, how many kids do you have in a year that are looking to do those online courses that are a bit increasing. shady? It's increasing. Uh, oh, well, I'm sorry. That are a bit shady. shady. Yeah, the ones uh, that you're kind of like, Meh, I don't think this is worth. You know, I mean, I can I, I can understand if they're taking classes from accredited universities that you know there's a track record, there's a history, there's clearly a, a yep. record of good use. But most of our online education is going through eAchieve, which is through the school district of Waukesha, which is to your point, it's going to follow Wisconsin model academic standards. <coughs> so I feel really comfortable in that area. It's when we start to get out of state schools that are being requested that I start to get a little bit itchy and a little bit of like, oh boy, I don't know how I'm gonna be responsible for figuring this one out for you. And that number is increasing. And, and that, so typically where that number starts to increase is in the summertime. Um, and so um, occasionally, and, and as you look through that policy, you'll see what about advancement. Um, and what we're encouraging is that we don't do more than one advanced course. Um, I did have instances where kids wanted to take upwards of two, three classes over the summer, and I'm going, all right, so all in, you're talking, two classes, you're talking about 18 months of curriculum and two and a half months. I also want you to be a, a kid um, and have that time as well, and so that's where my concern comes in, is how do we focus the academic mastery with the wellness and ensuring that we give kids a chance to um, be a kid as well. So, just um, for my clarification, is the distance learning is that primarily it's it's high school level classes that people are taking through other institutions um, just on, in an online format, or is it college classes? So uh, it's it's both. Oh, okay. It's both. Um, it's not just high school. Oftentimes, um, we use um, the art of problem solving, which is a, a different curriculum of math for some of our students. Okay. Um, that want to go through a different style of math. We've used that at the elementary level, all the way down to the elementary nice. levels. Okay. Um, we've used, uh, and quite honestly, where EHE falls, EHE actually doesn't fall within the distance learning because it's a Wisconsin school. It actually falls within the part-time open enrollment. So we actually part-time open enroll students into EHE. Oh, distance learning, again, is this whole other. It's not connected. It's online and not EHE is really what it comes down to. And then, um, and then if it was a college class, would it fall into the early and it's college gonna, credit? As thing? long as it's a Wisconsin UW systems, oh. and actually pri as long as it's a Wisconsin private or public school, it's going to fall into early college credit program for ninth through 12th graders. OK. OK, so I'm looking at the, the change that the state made with the early college credit pro program. Can you give me an example of a class that they would so? My understanding was pe people were taking college classes because they wanted to take something that was advanced that wasn't mm -hmm. offered here. Now it's something that's only it only is covered if it's a state statute graduation requirement. Correct. What classes would there be that we don't offer here? 
So here's here's a really interesting one that we would allow a student to take, but we would have to deny according to how legislation is written. Yeah. Japanese. Right. I was going to have not a graduation yeah. requirement yeah. according to state statutes, but clearly makes sense for you to go take Japanese 101. I get that. Well, I'm asked that we wouldn't cut. They'd have to pay 25 percent. I'm wondering, are there any classes that we would cover 100 percent? Third year math. Um, for an advanced level student, um, okay. an English course okay. in any of the four years uh, oh. we would cover, uh, because we need four years of English. Oh, and they could just choose, even though we're offering. As long as they're classes, taking a course yeah. that we are not offering. Okay. So if they took English literature, we'd go. We have an English literature co mm -hmm. course, but I'm going to take Shakespeare. Shakespeare, then we'd probably say okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's helpful. It's, I, I, it's not the cleanest pathway right. ever. And so this is, I, I have to give a lot of credit to our counselors who try to walk parents and students through this and it's never easy and it usually ends up in a long phone call with me um, and, and trying to walk people through it. It just, it's, it's a lot. Well, and I, and I think one of the other misapprehensions is that people often think if I'm taking one of these youth option classes, I will get college credit mm -hmm. that's going to diminish the number of classes I have to take when I get to right. college, and that's not necessarily true. So it's not even like an AP. Right. right. Okay. And even that doesn't guarantee it, depending on the right. school. There's a lot of nuance there that people don't understand. Right. The other layer of this is that then colleges have the ability to set their own stipulations. So right. UW Milwaukee just set their own stipulations, right. and they will only be accepting 11th and 12th graders for ECCP. So, so super great. Now I can explain that one. Yeah. So is there? I mean, do you have do you have a, a time when you meet with parents who are interested in this? Is there like an information session that parents can go to during high school orientation or? Yeah, so typically what we do is um, if we're getting a form in my office for ECCP um, or um, part-time open enrollment, we're pushing them, we're making sure that they've had some sort of meeting with counselors, or if they haven't, we encourage a meeting with counselors to start there, because oftentimes that counselor can help explain through them, because there's also a scheduling piece to this that's really right. important, that I struggle, I'm really great at talking through the legislation and how it can work. The actual scheduling component falls on the counselors to say, Here's how we can make this work within your schedule. So that's another added layer. The distance learning piece, oftentimes parents are meeting with Sam first to talk through those through those opportunities as well as the counselor. Okay. So is there a formal information session? We did one last year with our advanced learning families. In terms of it, um, in terms of an information session, no, we don't. We usually do those on a case by case basis to walk through because there's just so many your scenario is different from your scenario is different from your scenario. So like yes to you, no to you, it, it mm -hmm. just it gets to be a lot. And then it kind of sounds like I'm just making up rules. <laughs> when I'm not, I'm <laughs> actually trying to follow I, all of them. I do think it would be helpful um, to, to maybe just have an open yep. session one night about, hey, are you interested in taking classes at UWM yep. and that kind of, something like that. Um, you maybe don't cover all these different bases but even just op opening up the idea of college classes that I don't think a lot of students think about that. Yep. Or their parents don't may maybe necessarily know that right. it's an option for them right. as well. Yeah. Or you think, that's never going to work in the schedule to get to UWN. Which could be right. true. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, okay. that's, that's one of the key difficult right. pieces. Right. you got to have almost just two schedule. plus hours available. Right. Right. Yeah. And then now they've limited it to 11th and 12th graders. Which in specific classes, and we won't get feedback as to whether they're accepted until two weeks before the new semester starts. Really? Oh. UWM. Rightfully so, they're going to allow their students All to their choose their students, courses right. first and then, and then they put look at right. okay. our students. So right. we won't know until two weeks before. It's going to be, yeah, it's going to be icky. But UWM makes money. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just thinking they probably want to accept the students. Right? Yeah. It's getting, this, so when this changed from youth options to ECCP, I don't, I think the funding mechanisms changed considerably. For them, too? Yes. I see. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Um, okay, so we're tabling the action agenda item. There's no consent agenda. Um, so, public comments number two. 
All right, so board governance, um, facilities update. One day we won't have this on the, on the agenda. Um, so thank you to the FAC team for their very helpful comments on the survey and to all of you for all your very helpful comments on the survey. So it will be hitting the mailboxes on October 8th. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and so we've scheduled kind of our meeting to debrief with um, Sue and Bill and then bringing it to the board meeting on November 11th. That's where we're at. 13th, I think. It was. Or sorry, 13th. Um, okay, that's all I have for that. Um, and then the Human Relations Commission met? They did. And I promised Pablo that I would go, and then I had an emergency and couldn't go. So, and Pablo had guests. And so, so, anyway, okay. we didn't attend the last meeting. Okay. But, um, Pablo, I don't know if you, you attended one. Yeah, Previous I tend to that. Did you already report on that one? I did. Okay. I did. And then um, I did, uh, we got the minutes mm -hmm. from their meeting. A um, couple big things they did when they passed their mission statement, which I can review. So if I did, did you? Did you got it as well? <laughs> yeah, pull it up. Um, and then they've established kind of uh, some uh, subcommittees, uh, things statement that they passed reads as follows. We, the Human Relations Commission of Shorewood, cultivate community-wide change through learning, engagement, and policy to advance human dignity, respect, and civil rights. So that was their mission statement. And then they have some objectives and initiatives, and they kind of fall under these categories. One of them is education programming and outreach, the subcommittee. They all are. The other one is process, policy, and legislative review. And the third and last is data analytics, documentation, and report. And just to give you an idea of what they're covering, the education programming and outreach subcommittee covers everything from education around pronouns, uh, awareness of pronouns for gender and transgender populations, uh, cultural competence, alternatives to calling the police, um, uh, welcome, a new welcome new neighbors program. So it's kind of a broad, you know, uh, agenda that they have for basically making Shorewood a more inclusive community. So they're, they're covering a lot of ground. Okay. Great. Yeah. Well, so we, we, we one of us will be at the next meeting. Monthly, I think, right? Yeah, now they're going um, to monthly. Yeah. yeah, so the next meeting will be Thursday, October 11th at 630 <laughs> Maybe we'll both go to that. Maybe we will. <laughs> I have to look at my schedule. I haven't looked that far out yet. Okay. Um, great. All right. And then um, mm -hmm. we have one action agenda item, um, which is to approve the um, edits to our work plan where we added um, some reporting schedules for the work plans. Um, I'm looking at this right now, and I, I realize that the other that those should be in other business and not in board development. Um, and so, I may suggest that we um, not. Well, I guess I'll take a motion. No, I'll, I'll tell you what I think. <laughs> I make a motion that we approve the amended work plan. Or second. So, um, yeah, so I think actually um, we would put the other, we would put the reports coming from the administration into other business. That's not really board development, is how I think about board development. Mm -hmm. Like the board retreat is development for us. Mm -hmm. um, but work groups are really other business that inform, you know, like what's happening. So, and we can always bring it back. So you want you guys to not approve? Well, I'm saying that I, <laughs> I may that not approve. I think I might, or, sorry, yes? Yeah, or we can just bring it back yeah. with those edits. I think we got to flip board retreat, too, because we had board retreat in yeah. other so business. Yeah, so make that a, a change in here. And the other thing that I need 
Yeah, I'd want to add, I guess. Well, and it's fine. Is to I'd like to have another candidate um, forum, mm-hmm. for sc- yeah. school board candidate forum, in October, November. But that's fine. So with so those additions and that change. So do we want to? I move that we approve the work plan with, with those changes. Okay. As as you described. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Um, one of the things that we'll talk about, Jada put them in blue on here, is the linkages. So we'll talk about our very busy month of November um, at our board retreat. Okay. Um, and then we have a consent agenda. I will. I move that we uh, have support consent agenda. Approve it. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Um, all right, last public comments. Okay, to do items? Uh, edit the work plan. So we'll, <laughs> yes, we'll uh, make sure that the, uh, the work plan gets uh, gets I its can edits. send those, okay. Yeah. Huh. That's what I have. Okay. Um, and um, future agenda items? We had a rec advisory committee meeting uh, last okay. week. Okay. Is there a seed meeting coming up? Yes. So okay. we put that on there. Um, I'm going to the WASB resolutions meeting this weekend. 37 school districts um, participated, so we're one of 37, so we'll see mm-hmm. how that goes. Um, and then so also. In relationship to that resolution? Yeah. yeah. I haven't read all, they sent me the packet, I haven't read them yet. Um, and then Brian and I are meeting with um, the village um, president and um, village manager on Thursday to talk about budget issues. So I will bring back that discussion. Anything else in terms of future agenda items? Maybe you want to Okay. Okay. Then we are in recess.